Good evening, everyone tuning in from the India region. Uh, and good morning, good afternoon from uh, UK and uh, the Western part of the world. Welcome to this panel discussion celebrating the launch of Practical Council India, a collaboration between IDEX Legal and Practical Council. Practical Council is a specialist newsletter founded and edited by one of our panelists, Jonathan Middlebur. It's focused on the leadership management and relational issues that are mission critical to the senior in-house lawyer who aspires to a seat at the top table. IDEX is delighted to be partnering with Practical Council to bring this content and in due course, India-specific content to the in-house community in India. We hope you'll read the newsletter, which comes out weekly, and that you'll be part of the community who comment, share knowledge, and provide feedback um, when we start releasing the newsletter. The first one comes out very shortly on Monday, 4th of July. So do look forward to that. Um, to mark the launch, we've convened a specialist panel to discuss the development of high level leadership skills in senior lawyers. I'm delighted to introduce the panel, starting with Navneet Rishikeshan, who's currently Executive Director, Corporate Counsel for Cisco Service Provider Segment, responsible for the APAC and Japan regions. In this role, Navneet's led a team leads a team that manages all legal matters related to Cisco's telecom service providers, customers in the Australia, New Zealand, Japan, ASEAN, Korea, and India, and Sark theaters. He's also a member of the APAC and Japan Service Provider Management Board. Uh, he currently lives in Bangalore in India with his wife, who's also a lawyer and uh, family. When not at work, you'll find them keeping himself fit by running behind or ahead of his two young children and a very mischievous dog. Next, Nigel Spencer, a senior leadership development professional and executive coach, operating at director and board level with expertise in creating innovative talent management strategies for global professional services firms. Nigel's worked in professional services firms for 25 years, initially in a client-facing advisory role at PwC, Subsequent, subsequently, he was Global Learning Director at two international law firms, Simmons & Simmons and Reed Smith for 13 years, designing a number of award-winning development programs, including client relationship and leadership programs for associates and partners and business services teams. In addition, Nigel designed and led client learning programs for in-house legal teams and led major change initiatives, including the creation of the first innovation hub from the London office of a major law firm. Nigel is also currently the director of the Hub for Professional Practice in the Law School of Queen Mary University of London, and also an associate fellow at Sci Business School, University of Oxford, where he's contributed to the school's MBA and executive development programs, designing and leading one major program for the FCA. Next, we have Jonathan. Jonathan's an international consultant, both as founder and principal of his own consultancy, Middlebrook Associates, and as a principal of the international consultancy, Edge International. He's also the founder and editor of Practical News, a UK barrister by training and early professional career. And Jonathan subsequently trained and qualified as an organizational psychologist. Jonathan has extensive experience consulting to the in-house legal sector, both in India and internationally, on a wide range of leadership, management, and relationship skills. He's consulted and coached on a wide range of people issues, including senior level talent and human capital development in and to law firms, corporate legal departments, and providers to the legal services industry, such as LPOs. Jonathan's advised on a variety of issues, including talent management and succession planning, as well as advising on and facilitating organizational development and change, including in some of the world's largest legal departments, as well as within both law firms and in-house departments in India. As we mentioned earlier, his most recent initiative is bringing his two decades of experience together to curate practical counsel. Valerie Bowles really needs no introduction to the Indian legal community. Uh, she's the founder and principal of Silk Legal Consultancy, a well-known international consultant with vast experience consulting to law firms, both in India and internationally. She was COO of Amitran Mangaldas, and has held senior management positions at a number of law firms internationally over the last four decades. Well known for her progressive work at Amagens as COO, Valerie's been 
an advisor and implementer on practice management strategy and operational development for the professional services sector since 1980s, which has included extensive practical experience at CEO and COO board level for leading international and national organizations within Australasia, Asia, Europe, the Indian subcontinent and Africa, just the Antar both Antarctic levels to go next. Um, her specialities include, but are not limited to strategic analysis, differentiation methodology, governance, equity structure, mergers, financial operational efficiency, bottom line turnaround, leverance of technology, quality and risk management, resource planning, performance and career management, and navigating turbulent economic conditions, which is uh, parkour for where the environment we're in today. Um, as you'll agree, a vastly experienced panel. I'm really excited to be hosting. You know, we've got a world of experience from all around the world to dissect the topic of today's webinar, developing high level leadership in senior in-house council lawyers. Leadership, management, relational. Buzzwords that were alien to general councils just a few years ago, but have increasingly gained significance as the role and responsibilities of the GC within the organization has increased. But while the need and requirement of GCs to develop strong leadership and, and people management skills has grown, the development of those skills hasn't kept pace with that need in many organizations. So to dissect why developing leadership skills for the general counsel and the team is important, if not absolutely critical, we'll ask each of the panelists to spend a few moments reflecting on that point in alphabetical order. Um, so again, first, welcome everyone. Um, great to have you on board. Looking forward to a great conversation on a, an important topic. To kick start, we'll have Jonathan just sharing your thoughts on the whole concept of leadership as an important skill set to develop in house counsel. So thank you, Vikash. And um, I, I want to kick off by saying a big thank you to um, IDEX Legal for hosting this webinar. Um, how delighted I am that um, IDEX Legal have decided to partner with. Um, Practical Council, which is the newsletter that I set up um, earlier this, this year. It's a very, very exciting development for Practical Council and a particular pleasure for me knowing India as I do and given the work that I've done um, in India. So um, in, in relation to um, the opening question ar around um, the importance of uh, leadership skills for General Council and their team, um, I, I suppose I'd reflect on it in, in this way and I'm sure we will uh, expand on this uh, later in the conversation. Um, what I've observed in India is, is that over the uh, last um, 10 or so years, um, there's been an increasing uh, professionalization, if I can put it that way, of the, of the in-house um, function, particularly in, in um, uh, MNCs and the uh, larger domestic uh, Indian corporates. The expectations of the uh, board of the C-suite or in the case of MNCs of, of international colleagues, is that general counsel, CLO, and the senior lawyers operate at C-suite level. That means that they have to have the basket of leadership, management, and relational skills uh, equivalent to and at the level of their C-suite colleagues. In order to uh, influence uh, and bring value to uh, the CEO, to the CFO and other board members. They need to have skills around um, influencing, um, around communication and so on, a whole basket of skills that have not traditionally, um, if I can put it this way, been in the core wheelhouse uh, of um, senior uh, lawyers, uh, be they in private practice um, or, or in-house. And the importance then of developing these skills is that without these skills, uh, they will be marginalized, uh, their departments will be uh, marginalized. Um, and, and it's a bit of a, uh, a, um, a circular thing, that if you don't have the, uh, the skills uh, influencing and communication and so on, you won't get the budget uh, or the uh, seat at the table uh, in order to exercise those um, skills. So one very much um, feeds uh, into, into the other. Um, that's one of the reasons, uh, incidentally, and I'm sure we might touch on this later, why, why I, um, decided to uh, launch um, uh, Practical Council, not just for the India market, but uh, uh, globally, uh, because uh, my feeling was that um, 
the uh, inculcation, the transmission of some of these skills um, uh, is, is not as uh, is not as well done uh, within within legal in house um, as it might be. And I might comment on that a bit later, but uh, uh, I won't hold the airtime and uh, happy to um, pass on to the other panelists. Yeah, thank you, Jonathan, for that you know, quick intro to um, you know, the importance of that subject matter. Um, then, Beat, we're going to bring you in next to kind of give your a kind of quick viewpoint on, on that topic. Thank, thank you, Vikas. Uh, I think Jonathan has done a great job of putting the, the, the how out there and, and, and why we need to do it. But I think there's a very a much more fundamental reason why, you know, as a lawyer, you probably want to be thinking about these things, right? And and that's just pure uh, survival. Uh, and I think the reason for that is, I mean, if you look at the world today, the world is changing, right? And we were we were discussing a little while ago about how the way we train our lawyers is changing. Uh, it's you know, work from home, hybrid work, whatever you want to call it, right? Uh, the, the technology is coming in in a big way. And in my experience, uh, having been a technology lawyer for the last 20 odd years, uh, once technology comes in, it's very difficult to kick it out again, all right? So, so the fact of the matter remains that to be an effective lawyer in-house uh, in a company, you need to have the ability to influence uh, the decisions the company makes. Uh, that helps you grow personally and professionally, but more importantly, uh, if you are able to build the skills that they're looking for in leaders, particularly how to influence people, how to understand the environment, uh, how to build a team, how to you know, build a strategy, for example, uh, if you have those skills, that really differentiates you from the machine that's going to come in and do the MBAs for you, right? And, uh, and therefore, I think it's critical for all of us to build skills which, are, uh, which will keep us ready for for the next phase of the evolution of the workplace and, and the, the, the corporate entities that are out there. Uh, so so if, if for nothing else, do it for yourself would be my message. Yeah, great one, which you know, we, I think we might get to talk about the technology bit as well, but it's kind of, a, it's one of those kind of big elephants in the room that you know, we're not quite seeing you know, what real impact that's happening you know, in the long term, because you know, it's just kind of, especially during COVID, we're just, you know, the in-house community has taken more on board, but not fully realizing the potential long-term consequences of that. Uh, Nigel, we're going to bring you in to kind of add your kind of um, you know, thoughts around, you know, the topic. Sure. No, thank you. Well, delighted to be here. Um, thank you very much, Vikas, for the invitation and to IDEX Legal. And just to build on one thing you said, Navneet, as well, just thinking about how jobs are evolving, as you say. You know, I remember when someone on my team once came in to me and said, oh, what's going to happen? We're automating this, this, and this at the junior level of the team. What happens? And I said, good news. Your job gets even more interesting. You can actually evolve your skills and actually, you know, your job becomes different in a really interesting way. So I would absolutely just to echo that point, first of all, Navni, around be open to change, be open, you know, as famous Darwinian phrase goes, you know, it's not the strongest that survive, it's the ones who are most adaptable. So I couldn't agree more, especially as the world moves faster and faster. Um, and just to build on a point that Jonathan and Anthony, I think you've both hinted at as well, you know, why is it important to do the management leadership for all the reasons that have been said already? Also, there's the point for me, which I think you've, you've hinted at, it's like your reputation, your reputation, who do you want to be in the organisation? Who do you want to be amongst your stakeholders, the board, the C-level folk, your key, your key customers, in, internal customers, or your external network as well? How do you want to be described by them as well? So as you, as you say, Navni, you know, how do you want to develop your team? And, and I think just to add in VCAS as well, one important point, you know, there's, there's that for yourself, but also think about your team. How do you want to attract in a very hot talent market where it's hard to attract and retain people, how are you going to attract and retain people as well is through having some really great leadership and management skills as well. So for me, there's a massive point here around retention Bcash as well. So, so that's just a th few thoughts around, you know, why it's important to, to evolve your skill sets, as you said, Navni, but also both for yourself, your reputation, how you want to be described, but also for team retention and skills retention as well. In, in, you know, so for all those reasons, I would say that there are many, many more, but let me end there. Yeah, super, thanks. Um, Valerie will bring you in to add, um, I know they've already covered a lot of the conversation, but you, know, you come from a different perspective. So what would you contribute to that thought process? 
Sorry. Thanks, Vikas. Um, yes, I do come at this from a slightly different uh, perspective um, because my starting point is uh, revenue um, effectiveness of operations. And I look at the stars of lawyers over the decades that I've been in legal. And the question always is, how do you replicate those stars? How do you pass the sunshine and the stardust down? And this is by learning, teaching, um, guiding. It isn't just by throwing people in the deep end, because if you throw people in the deep end only, some of them will drown. Um, so you do want to teach some of them to swim. So it's quite, um, mine's quite simple. I won't belabor the point because I'm anxious to get on to a debate between us because the rich content that we've all spoken about um, needs to be developed between us. So that's mine. Right, yeah, we will get on to, um, you know, how not to drown as a lawyer later on in the conversation. Um, <laughs> I'd like to remind the audience that um, we like to make this interactive. Um, so it's not simply a uh, kind of one way conversation. So. Feel free to put questions in the chat, um, which we'd like to address during the conversation. Um, at some point near the end of the session, you know, we're happy to also bring you on as, you know, you know bring you on as you know, video and audio if you want to have an intera a live interaction with the, with the panel as well. So it's very much, you know, a different kind of format to you know, normal webinars, but it's really much, it's very much as much you getting value from answering the kind of questions that you have regarding this topic, as well as us talking about them. Uh, well, kick off with the first question, um, uh, Nigel and Jonathan. What are the advantages, I mean, we've already touched on it, but what are the advantage, advantages for the GC and his team or her team in developing their management and leadership skills when their roles are still primarily, you know, and especially in the India region, you know, very technically focused? Um, well, if I, if I was just to expand a little bit, I mean, we've, as you say, we've, we've given a number of reasons already. There's the point around how fast everything's evolving, how fast the roles are evolving. And I think, you know, that various aspects to management and leadership, you know, the classic definition of what's the difference between management and leadership, they say management's around control, leadership's around influence and persuasion and, and sort of setting a vision and, and taking people on a journey. So I think there, even just in those phrases, there are a number of aspects where probably, I hope for many of you listening, you're thinking, Absolutely, that's relevant for me. I mean, there needs to be some aspects where we control and we have good process in the team. And, and how, we, how do we do that? How do we establish those, those kind of procedures, those skill sets, that frame of operating? Um, but then actually, both for myself and my stakeholders, going back to some of the things we said already, Vikash, how do, we, how do we influence and persuade, whether, as you said, I think, Jonathan, around budget or, or whatever it is, but how do we actually... What's the message of what we're doing in the organization? Who are we in the organization? I think it's a really interesting point as you reach your cross function, as you work more cross function, I think that becomes key. So bound up in there, there are a number of skill sets. You can even be, you know, we could spend an hour and a half probably just unraveling all the skill sets involved in that, in, the, in those little, in those aspects as well. But for me, especially the pace of change and, you know, and also the factors, as I think we've all been saying, the scale of operating, the environment you're operating in, the context you're operating within becomes more is becoming more complex, more fast moving, more opaque, more difficult to navigate. So that for me really speaks to the need to have some important management and leadership skills, I would say, Vikash, amongst other, among, you know, just the pace of change, frankly. Yeah. yeah. How well, much are yeah. you seeing that kind of grow as uh, an understanding that of its importance um, you know, over time? Uh, Jonathan, do you want to do that? Or do, you want, do you want me to? Well, well, I was actually just going to. Yeah, I, 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 I can, I can do, and and, and um, but let me just sort of pick up first of all, if, if I may, on on something you were just saying, uh, Nigel. That's about the kind of complexity of the modern organisation. I think that applies whether you're talking about the sort of MNCs or or, or the um, large Indian domestic uh, corporations. These are very complex organisations. I've um, in practical counsel, um, two of the last few issues have. have um, come at things from, from what some people might have seen a slightly um, obscure angle. So uh, in uh, one issue, um, I think two or three issues back, um, I, I uh, contrasted uh, the leadership of um, the uh, current UK um, uh, Prime Minister Boris Johnson and her leadership, Her Majesty the Queen. And in this week's issue, um, I interviewed uh, one of the world's leading uh, orchestral um, conductors. There, there was some uh, reasoning <laughs> behind that. Um, and in both cases, it, it was sort of linked to the com complexity of different organisations. The, um, 
the orchestra uh, is an, an analogue actually to the um, in-house legal department. It consists of uh, sections and uh, managing and leading in that sense, that organisation requires the uh, empowerment of the section leaders who then uh, manage uh, downwards uh, within their sections. And it's exactly the same um, by um, analogy with um, the in-house legal department where the GC needs to empower um, the DGCs um, who, who then um, help cascade things down the organisation. But then there's the other point that, that you're making, Nigel, which is the kind of cross-functional point, and how many of these modern organisations are very complex matrix organisations where, of course, you have kind of straight line um, where, in a sense, you can command and control. But, of course, that whole command and control thing has broken down over, over the years and decades as professionals have become more and more empowered. So you can't really command and control in an old-fashioned uh, kind of military sense. But then, of course, the kind of dotted line or the soft relationships um, uh, in a matrix organization where you might uh, report into one person but then have dotted line across uh, to various different people, plus the sort of web of, of informal relationships. You can't possibly um, navigate all of that with pure technical skills. You have to build um, uh, skills that, that, that um, unpack, as you say, Nigel, beyond just sort of pure influence as a whole basket of skills and behaviours and so on that, that sits under that. Uh, and that's that's of great importance. In terms of, you know, uh, the second part of the question, which is how things are going to develop, I, I think they're only going to become more complicated. Um, and it links back to the point um, that was being made by Navni to that technology and that you built upon, um, Nigel. Um, technology is going to play an increasingly important role. We're going to have, uh, you know, we've had machine learning, we've had a little bit of AI, uh, artificial intelligence, that's probably going to uh, multiply. Uh, for sure, and we can't envisage what it's going to look like in uh, 5, 10, let alone 15 years' time. If we think about the pace of change that's been in the last 5, 10 years, um, this is going to become massively more complicated. Navigating the technology, navigating the people, navigating the complex stakeholder relationships, all of this is going to uh, require uh, an increase, increasingly greater sophistication of leadership and management and relational skills, in my view. Um, and I presume, you know, both of you have you seen that, you know, as we're saying, you've seen that kind of shift in terms of um, the GC and the in house council understanding more and more of the kind of complexity and need for training up to be leaders, uh, training up the leadership skills and management skills within the organization. Yeah, and I mean, if um, I'm sure Nigel will comment as well in a second, but just specifically in the Indian in house um, uh, context, um, you know, one of the organizations I worked with was, was indeed Matrix. It was the, the, the India um, legal team of a, of a big uh, multinational uh, reporting into uh, Europe um, headquarters, um, different languages, different uh, cultural norms across the organization, um, across the region for that matter. And, and indeed, um, which was fascinating to me uh, when I first started working in India, obviously you have regional uh, complexity within India, very different cultures as between North and South and, and, and different sub-regions and subcultures. Um, that, 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 that takes a lot. And if you don't have any um, support in terms of, of kind of um, developing those, um, those skills, it's not surprising that you might, you might feel, um, to use your uh, word earlier, that the cash that you're sort of drowning a bit. Sorry, sorry, Angela, I think I might have cut you off. Apologies. That's fine. No, all, all I was going to chip in with actually, Jonathan, was to say, and, and Vikash, on this point, how have we seen this this uh, work in, in the GC world? Well, certainly in some GC teams, um, I've seen them go, th really think about that developmental point of playing to people's strengths and thinking about your team members' strengths as well. And what choices did the GC, I remember talking to one GC and they said, well, what I realized was it might be quite interesting, especially because my team's of enough of a size, that actually I could think about developmental pathways for some of my team. Some of them, a bit like, you know, you could say in a law firm, private practice as well, are some of them going to be really technical folk? Are some of them going to be the relationship folk? Are some of them going to be the ones who innovate a lot? Are some of them going to want to uh, have expertise here? Some, da, 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 da. And so they said, actually, 
I'm very open to med different members of my in-house legal team having different career pathways, but they were very much linking in Bikesh to this, this very you know, well-known, you know, everyone talks about playing to strengths now. Let's not try and all be superhuman or pretend we're superhuman and say we're brilliant at everything. But where are my strengths? What gives people energy? Again, going back to that, the retention of talent point, if we can identify where the strengths are and where we can actually help people spend more of their day doing things they're really good at, really enjoy, and that contribute, as you say, perhaps in a broader way, as, as we were saying, not just in a purely technical way, that must be a good thing to do. And it was interesting talking to a few GCs about that. Um, I mean, Navni, I don't know if you've got any perspectives on that as well. <laughs> no, you're, you're absolutely right. I think uh, it's, you know, when you, uh, th there are limitations though, right? I mean, you know, it's uh, every world we live in has its own limitations. So, but, but within that, within the context, I think the, you know, to so put it put it in a in a simple way, in in an in-house department, I think making sure that people get along well together is probably one of the most important things you can do. Right? It's somewhat irrelevant in a law firm, <laughs> at least for the old-style rainmaker partners. Right? Uh, and and I think when you when you but when you come in-house, I think the the ability to get along well with people or the ability to work in a team. I think that takes on a lot more importance. Uh, being self-driven to a certain extent becomes a lot more important. Now, uh, one of the things that we have struggled with over the years is, is similar to a law firm situation, right? Where the, the normal way you grow in an organization is how? By having teams reporting into you. That was the, the, the old style approach, right? So you want to become a director in Cisco, you need to have a certain number of people working for you in your team. Uh, but what happens to situations where you need a really senior lawyer uh, handling competition law matters, for example, or, or a patent law issue or, or, or the like? They may not necessarily have a big team. So, so I think, so we actually looked at how the engineering side does it in Cisco, right? So in the engineering side of the house, you have this concept of managers, right? So they follow the usual route, director, vice president, and the like. But you also have this concept of the fellow right and the distinguished engineer and the like who have who are equivalent in salary and uh, designation uh, they call something else but they you know what they are right uh, but they don't have the necess the requirement to be managing people so so again i think to a certain extent when you look at your team you don't want everybody to be uh, the rainmaker right you probably need a few uh, you also need people who are good at what they do who are happy where they are and then you need the ambitious people who want to be managing the people and the like. But it's not a it's not a one one hat fits all situation. Uh, you need to look at it's just because somebody's a very good lawyer doesn't make them a very good manager, for example. Right. Uh, so you have to really bring in ways in which you can assess, uh, you can guide, and you can give everybody a career path. To your point, uh, Nigel. Yeah. Super, super point. I mean, it leads on very naturally to the next question. Um, I mean, some of it you've answered already in terms of um, interesting about when you get to a sizable legal department uh, and the GC frees himself up, him or her, you know, they free themselves up from the kind of doing the groundwork, to thinking more strategically and looking at career paths for the teams. And that interesting one that, you know, we can have this common perception that, you know, everyone should be a leader. That's, you know, that's a focus that everyone should train up to, to lead essentially. But, and what, what you're saying is that may, may not necessarily be the career path for everyone. Um, some of them may just be like, like I was saying, great technically, so that's where you help develop them further. You know, they may not want to manage you know, or lead, so let's focus on that. Can I, can I just um, interrupt there? Sorry, um, Vikas, just on this um, point about leadership. Um, leadership can be of a small group, so picking up the point that um, playing to your strengths is absolutely vital. Um, but leadership isn't just the head honcho. And I think that just needs to be clear that the leadership that we're talking about can be um, quite minor. And just to um, just want to pick up a point that somebody has just asked a question on, which is the, um, trying to deal with the work and the wider world, which should they concentrate on? That is a really difficult um, point because to be a leader, um, you have to have confidence in the people who report to you that they can 
carry out the work if you're not able to focus on it the whole time. So I think the whole concept of leadership, and, and I mean that in the broadest sense, has evolved so much that the skills that we used to look at, which was, yes, the head honcho knows everything, can do everything, and is perfect at everything, has changed. And that in the law needs to be understood that everybody has something to learn and can to, to contribute, not necessarily, I want to be the big guy. I think that's, yeah. uh, that's quite important too. Just, just to add to that point, just slightly, if I, if I may, um, what you've got to remember also is, is that um, uh, in-house, um, people are op operating at the, at the very top of um, corporate organisations, um, you know, top, top tier with, with GC or CLO um, really getting a seat at the C-suite table at board, um, you know, assuming that happens and it does in, in, um, uh, in, in many organisations now, the CLO is regarded as a critical voice at the table because of issues around uh, enterprise risk, corporate risk, legal risk, and so on. And, and the bigger portfolio that they have often embracing compliance, regulatory, government affairs sometimes, they're operating at the, uh, at the board level. That means the DG, DGCs are operating at one tier below that. So at the very top of the corporate organization, um, they can sometimes really be quite young and inexperienced managerially and as leaders, because for example, they can have been brought in from private practice where they may have been partners in their firms, but they've had a very different leadership and influencing role than their required to have now uh, and they're operating with operators uh, people who have, have been um, uh, in the on a corporate path and acquiring uh, political skills let me let me call them what they are um, for decades uh, whereas the political skills they've acquired are, are a lot less sophisticated and um, frankly um, in, in a law firm just because of the, of the different complexity or lack of relative complexity of that organization. So that, that's something that I think is really an, quite an important factor, I think, to emphasize. I don't, I don't know whether, whether you agree in that need. Oh, I, I think, yeah, no, you're right. I mean, I think the, you know, the, the, the reality is, I think you, you are going to be in a situation where, so, and I'm, I'm kind of, distracted a bit by Akshay's question that's, uh, that he has put in there, which is about, you know, whether the next phase of development for the human kind is the, you know, service and service leadership taking prominence, right, and empathy. Well, and, yeah, well, we might bring in some of the questions later on. Okay, yeah. fine. So, no, so, but the point I was trying to make was, I think the, the ultimate point you really, the, where you want to get to is, uh, and Valerie's point is absolutely spot on, which is, you know, you don't really need everybody to be the CEO, right? Uh, leadership is something you show in your day-to-day -day life. You can show it in how you do a, a simple transaction. Uh, it does not, you know, uh, our, our current CEO, Chuck Robbins had a very great, a great quote, uh, which, he, which he once told us, uh, which was, lead before the org, org structure allows you to do so, right? So, don't wait for, to become the CEO to, to behave like a CEO. That, of course, doesn't mean that you roam around ordering your bosses around, for example, <laughs> but, uh, but it's all more about being inclusive and, and, and ensuring that everybody's driving it together, right? Uh, so I think, yeah, completely agree. And we'll come back to the other question later, actually. Yeah. Um, yeah. uh, Vikas, can I just build on Valerie's point as well, which I thought was, you know, which Nathan needs to say, if I, if I may. I was just going to say, it's a key point. Leadership, as you, just, as you both just said, it will help you as a leader, say if you're the top of your little org chart or part of the org chart, if you have leadership throughout the team underneath you or you know, around you as well. So, but what that also implies, of course, is that you've got to give people the opportunity and the feeling that they can take, they can step in and step towards opportunities and show, you know, and show leadership, whatever, as you say, Nathalie, whatever stage they're at. I mean, you'll have heard, you know, I tried a few times these reverse mentoring initiatives where you get the more junior person to mentor the senior people. And it's a great way of actually making people in different parts of the hierarchy feel that knowledge doesn't have to just go in one direction in the team. And I think it's a very, very valuable thing, but Valerie, absolutely your point and Daphne is to say, leadership, let, let leadership come from different parts of your team. 
because as I said, we're, we're all experts in different things and we'll all bring our strengths and skill sets. You know, certainly my children teach me stuff all the time about things I don't know about devices or, you know, med, you know, all the digital stuff and everything. So, you know, let the leadership come from different places. That was my, that was a thought, Vikash. Yeah, great point. I mean, because we, you know, we, we could have the old school model of it you know, comes from the top down. You've done 20, 30 years of experience and therefore you're set to kind of, I actually remember my first, uh, when I started off my first career, like 20 years ago, I was at um, one of the big top five professional services back then. And uh, the, the, the model we were then was, uh, you know, you've got, your, you've got your set career path to partner. This is what you're going to do. These are the hours you're going to do. This is, you know, the work you've got to do. And there's no way of fast tracking that. And it's, you know, there was stuff I was, you were doing at the beginning and that we were like, as juniors at 50, 58 pound an hour, having to photocopy. And I'd be like, why are we doing all this basic stuff? It makes no sense. You know, you're going as, you know, as, you know, smart freshers. And the answer would be, well, that's how we did it. So that's what you've got to do if you want to learn the track to, you know, to the top. Um, you know, and it was one of the reasons I was like, yeah. this is not the right environment for me because it doesn't make sense. And, you know, I think that's going to be more amplified in today's generation because, you know, they're it's not going to simply uh, stand up to listening to that. My kids don't. They're 14, 11. I can no longer say to them, that's the way we did it. So you've got to do it. It's partly amplified the cash because you know social media yeah, you yeah. Know, won't wear that you know they, there's glass door and there's this and there's that and there's the other app uh, plus all the all the gossip rags um, that, that we we know of uh, <laughs> will, that will uh, call out that kind of practice and uh, millennials post millennials etc won't wear that yeah yeah, yeah I want to I want to quickly get on to um, you know one of the earlier questions we've answered some later ones but um, so this whole concept about you know. Lawyers could, you know, be trained in different areas. They could specialise their careers in different you know, segments. Not everyone has to be, or even should be, you know, the leader you know, or the boss. But can you? So, for what about lawyers that, you know, think actually we want to be the leader and we want to develop our leadership management skills? Um, but you know, you might think they're not cut out for those kind of roles. Uh, Nigel, can you actually train lawyers to be better to have better leadership and management skills? Uh, the answer to that is the answer to that is yes, we can all get better at leadership and management skills. You know, I, over many different things I tried in, in, you know, I'd be delighted to hear everyone's views on this on the panel as well. I would say, you know, one thing I'm conscious of, Vikash, is budgets as well. Let's put that on the table in terms of budgets and what budgets we have. Do we all have budgets to send people to Harvard for their leading, leading law, you know, in the legal sector courses and stuff like that? No, we don't. And I'll go back to something we've just been talking about in the last few minutes, if I may, Vikash. Learning by doing. I'm a massive fan over 15 or 20 years, what I've seen work really well. It's not, okay, if you have a program, get people to practice. Leadership for me is about letting people, giving people a safe space on a program, for example, a short course, whatever it is, to practice, to, to have a point of view, to give them a point of view, but then let them practice something, whether that's the leadership skill of, you know, having a very powerful vision and how you express that in a team meeting, or whether it's how you give feedback to people, or whether it's how you connect and network and how you land in a different part of the organization. How do you represent yourself when you go and have that first conversation with a part of your network you never had before? But for me, it's about practice. And I think the good news on this is, is that there's a lot of opportunity to give people these experiences then. I know we mustn't throw them in the deep end to come back to a phrase, isn't it? but I think if I was to say, throw them in the deep end with skill and with some support, I do think stretching them in those situations, in my experience, is a really good way, not, not just to help them grow those skills, but actually to help motivate them as well and give them a sense. But then what you've got to do also, as we said about the leadership of different levels of the team, is then give them real opportunities to practice. So if you do put them on a programme, for example, then it's saying, okay, but now I would like you to run that project, you know, using all those skills, run that project for the next six months you know you're responsible now for this this and this i know you've never done it before i'm there in the background as your you know your wing person you know as your mentor whatever it is but learning by doing you know there's that 70 20 10 method of development where we say we learn 70 percent as adults on the job 20 percent we learn from others and only 10 percent should be formal courses of what we do that was the center for creative leadership that came up with that i'm a massive fan of that on the job learning let people apply the skill get the feedback, apply it again. It's also a way you build confidence, Vcash, as well, because going back to that thing of lawyers, legal people, folk potentially being brittle in the sense of, you know, I've never failed in my life. I always got top grades. I'm now in a role. Oh, what happens if this doesn't go quite right? 
giving people the chance to learn, to do, to adapt, to evolve the design thinking type approach to life that entrepreneurs always take, where they just say, hey, I'll just shrug my shoulders, I'll have a go. It might go well, it might go 80%, okay. Let people learn by doing with mentorship, within the risk management bounds, you need that to be within for your team and your team's brand almost, but give them a chance to try stuff. That would be my strong message. Yes. If I may, I, I totally agree. Um, uh, and I very much subscribe to the 70, 20, 10 rule as well. I think um, one of the misunderstandings when, when there's talking about learning on the job, there's learning on the job and there's learning on the job. The, the old lazy way is kind of sink or swim. Um, yes, they'll just learn by experience. You just chuck them out there and, and they'll acquire experience. Of course, you know, some people do, some people flourish, but it's not the, um, the best approach. The best one is very much what Nigel is advocating, which is um, let them learn, but, but help them to reflect on their learning, provide opportunities for them to stretch provide opportunities for them to, to fly and take wing. Don't punish them when uh, occasionally they kind of crash and burn. That's, that's part of the learning also. And if you can then provide the support that uh, helps them learn from failure, and you can role model failure as well sometimes that you've you failed and you fail you know, all the time. Um, and uh, you've got some humility and you'll learn, learn from that. that. That to my mind is what learning by on the job um, at its best uh, means, rounded out by the sort of um, 20% and the 10%, and the, and the formal interventions uh, can be important, but they are only um, a small part of the of the picture. And and Nigel's also right that you know budget only allows a certain amount of that set piece intervention. So you're constantly trying, I think, uh, to find ways to um, get the best bang for your buck on um, budget. Um, so, so that the, the, the money you are spending on intervention uh, is well spent and that it's buttressing uh, all, all of the good stuff that you are doing um, in terms of uh, giving your team opportunities to learn. Yeah, and I think it's a great clarification because like you said, the common misconception about on the job learning is you literally just throw them at the deep end and, and they'll, they'll swim. But, but as Valerie mentioned, some of them, not everyone does swim. Some of them are actually drown in that stress and that anxiety because they're not getting the feedback and it's just not the right environment the right approach to, to learning yeah can i can i just butt in here about um uh the cost of uh training and development and guidance and spending time on that um, because that's often the question oh i don't have the budget um it is cost effective i mean this what we're talking about today should improve your bottom line it will make people more more effective in in the short term as well as the um longer term so that's, it's an important point to remember. Yeah, because, you know, that, um, I, wanna, I wanna bring in one of the, um, the questions that links into what we're talking about, the first one, which was, how would you advise in-house lawyers and leadership team to focus on the day-to-day -day work along with making a presence felt in a global space of the organization? So it's kind of like, you know, you wanna get on your job, but you also wanna kind of you know, be shown that you're, you know, you're a potential star in the organization. So how do you get what advice would you give to getting that balance? Um, and think, let me bring you in on that one because obviously you, you know, work with a lot of these kind of young potential stars in the organization. Sure. So, I mean, to be honest, it's something all of us struggle with, <laughs> right? It's uh, trying to find that balance. Uh, I think there's an American saying, which I picked up while living there, which is, you know, you need to learn to chew gum and walk at the same time, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and I think to a certain extent, uh, your day-to-day -day job is what really differentiates you, right? So uh, that's how you get noticed. Uh, and now there's an old saying that goes that, you know, that your, how well you do your day job doesn't get you the promotion, it gets you your salary, right? Uh, and, and how do you uh, kind of exhibit the, the features or, or the, the leadership skills that the organization is looking for uh, while doing your day job? I think that's that's important, right? And I, as as you grow through the, you know, the different organizations do this differently. But the way I look at uh, the structure in my department, and depending on, you know, if you're a junior lawyer, you are expected to learn on the job, like uh, hopefully with some guardrails, right? Uh, your technical abilities, how to negotiate, how to 
look at issues, that kind of thing, uh, under supervision, right? And and the supervision lessens as time goes by, right? So if you uh, so if you're a corporate council, you will get a certain higher level of supervision than others. And as you become more and more senior, it becomes less so. Uh, when you are a senior council, we expect you to be good at implementing stuff. So I just need to give you high level guidance saying do X, Y, Z, and you figure out how to do X, Y, Z, right? You build the strategy for it, you build the plan for it, but it's more tactical than the strategy. And as you get more and more senior, you become a director and above, you're expected to set the strategy, right? So, so you, that's one approach. So depending on where you are in the in your development field, I think that's how how I recommend organizations look at it. Uh, at the same time, we have to be open to the idea that sometimes a, a fresh graduate from law school can give you the best idea that you would not have thought of. Right. So you have to be open. You have to have an environment of trust in the organization that enables people to come up and say it. Uh, and I've been I've been tooling around for a while with my team on on a set of what I call uh, you know a kind of a set of terms shall I say we are lawyers right so we we love our terms and conditions uh, and and the terms are basically relating to how I will be a manager to you right and and they got some basic promises from my side uh, you know I will never reschedule a meeting that you have asked for you will always get time with me when you need it. Uh, you will not have to wait for your performance review to hear about how you're doing. You will know where you stand. Uh, you know, you will I, will, I will always listen to what you have to say. I will not be defensive. Uh, and, and then of course, there are some reciprocal requests, right? And, and the most important thing is the truth. So if you see something going wrong, I expect you to tell me, not wait for the, you know, there's an old saying which says, uh, don't come to me with problems, come to me with solutions. I, th I think that's a mistake right? Because you're waiting for the problem to really blow up by the time somebody figures out a solution. I think we can all think of solutions much faster when we are all together and thinking together as a team. But, but there are these criteria or, or these things that you try to put together, which tries to give, to build, uh, I, think, I think one of the panelists mentioned, right? The, the environment of trust, the environment of bring, letting people bring their authentic selves to work, right? Uh, and if you can do that and then connect it to uh, the work, I think you will get, you will be able to do not just the day-to-day -day stuff, which is which is what you, what's which is what will pay your salary, but also help you to do the big picture things or bring up ideas of the big picture things, which will actually be great for you for your career growth. Right. So I don't know if I answered the question completely, but because I'll stop there. Yeah, no, it makes great sense. Jonathan, do you want to um, you know contribute because you've worked with a lot of you know in-house counsel and in-house lawyers and kind of. I'm sure that kind of dynamic of, you know, we're technically good, we want to get on with work, but how do we kind of make our presence felt? You, know, you would have had to have dealt with that in your kind of coaching work you know, with various accounts, various in-house lawyers. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a little bit hard to, to, to generalize um, because it depends uh, really um, what sort of um, mandate one's got um, and that's um, budget dependent. Uh, so, you know, at, at its um, at most um, budget generous, um, you can work on one on one with uh, senior leaders um, and that kind of um, detailed um, textured uh, working with individuals means that, um, you know, you're working on, on, on relationships um, and use them um, sort of in the moment. Um, so that if somebody, for example, has a blocked relationship through to the CFO or um, is not finding themselves um, operating optimally at, at board level, you're, you're able to really sit and, and analyze um, why they think that blockage is, is, is happening. And then you can work with them on strategies, um, techniques, and so on. And, and, and they can then try them out sort of in real time and bring back to the um, coaching sessions um, what the, out, the outcome is. Um, you know, by contrast with something like practical counsel, we might come on to this a bit later, what I've been trying to solve for is, is um, uh, an, an issue that I've, I've felt that um, many of the legal departments that I've, um, if not worked with, um, been in touch with and, and chatted to, um, that, that they just don't have the budget. Um, and uh, they might have quite large teams or they might be quite isolated. They might be 
um, sole practitioners as it were, or, or part of you know one, two, three uh, man, woman um, departments. Um, and they just, there's no way um, on, on, on God's earth that they're gonna get the budget for um, high level executive coaching. So what do you do, do there? And the, the idea with practical counsel is it's a bit of a sort of drip, drip, drip of um, leadership learning. Um, you hope uh, that they have some um, support from, uh, from, from a senior mentor or, or they've got a good GC or a good CLO who's um, supporting them, but they may not. Uh, in which case um, the in intention of practical counsel and, and you know I really really welcome um, feedback from um, subscribers and there's going to be a lot of subscribers in, in India I'm delighted to say um, I, I really want to know um, your thoughts about what is helpful and what is less um, helpful um, you know I've often thought that that you know with the formal interventions that we talk about sort of 10 percent that when you go on a course or, or um, a formal intervention uh, often expectations are a bit too high and lawyers can be quite dismissive. You know, I didn't get that much out of it. Um, I, I was told by one of my mentors that if you go on one of those uh, interventions and, and you extract one, two, three nuggets, um, that's unbelievably um, helpful. But those nuggets that really you're carrying with you one year down the track, three years down the track, five years down the track, you've been on a one year, a one day course, and that's all you've taken away. That can still achieve quite a significant shift in, in behaviour. Yeah, we're hoping we contribute more than a few nuggets today during this hour of it. Well, obviously, you, you try and you try and um, shower people with gold dust. Yeah. Um, it doesn't always happen. Um, and courses I've been on um, myself in my leadership, I, I've not taken super amounts uh, away from, but I've always you know, taken one or two things. And that's been that's been really, really valuable. Yeah, because just to add a point just very quickly there is I couldn't agree more. And I think for me, there's a massive point around if you do, you know, go budget permitting, if you go on those types of programs or you ask your team, you know, if you find opportunities for your team to go, the accountability of the learning and almost putting it into practice afterwards, which again goes back to this point we've been discussing about how do you create the opportunities for them to practice after they've learned something, but even getting them to work in pairs as like buddy pairs or whatever in the team to almost hold each other accountable for having a go at something and saying, well, did you have a go at having that feedback conversation? Or did you have a go with connecting with the other department in, in the company? You know, and just anyway, there's something about accountability for actually getting the value out of it for me as well. Yeah, and then um, what we're going to do, I mean, we're going to pick up that piece in a little bit. We're going to ask um, Akshay to come in. He's had a couple of interesting questions, which um, he Navneet mentioned earlier. So we'd like to bring him in live to ask those questions to, uh, to the panel and have that discussion. So Anikit, if you could ask Akshay to join as a panel member, he can interact with us face to face. Hi. Hi. Good to see you. It's good to see you, Valerie and Jonathan, whom I know from before. So really, really happy to be here. Uh, and I'm so glad I chose to be on this webinar, which just popped up on my calendar. It was not on my schedule today. And I chose to urgently make uh, you know, room for this webinar. I'm loving being here. So, you know, being an associate, uh, like a senior in-house counsel myself uh, in the past, I cannot relate more to this uh, because influencing is the way. Uh, legal departments, as Navneet would know, are not revenue generators for a corporate. And at the same time, they have a significant role to play. And there is an inherent structural tussle between sales and legal, right? Uh, control won't help. Uh, and the only way uh, you can really contribute to the corporate uh, you serve is by influencing. And we keep talking in all conferences. Now this phrase of being business enabler is being spoken to at death, right? But how to really enable business and how to get that balance between uh, risk management and being a business enabler? Because you can be business enabler by just saying approved, approved to everything by closing your eyes, but you won't be doing your job then, right? And if you keep saying no to everything, you won't be doing your job too. So you, that balance is what defines any GC today. And uh, I think this development of what typically is known as soft skills, but one needs to be very hard at these soft skills, right? 
of uh, leadership and influencing are so critical. So thanks to IDEX Legal and Practical Law for breaking this uh, to four. Uh, and yeah, so my questions, I think all panelists have already read, but I'll just repeat for the sake of repeating that it really touched me when I heard Aichek Adizas, who is uh, uh, you know founder of Adizas Institute and he's a uh, quite well-known management guru globally. When he made this analogy, he said, see, in 16, 17, since human civilization came into being from forest still agriculture, physical power was value, right? And then it moved to machinery, industrialization, and so on and so forth. Still, there's a mechanical power mixed with supply chain, some intellect. And then it moved to all the value being in the brain and intellect. And today, the big companies are Google, Facebook, Microsoft, uh, Cisco, and uh, not so much the mechanized world, right? Uh, next phase, he says, will be heart based, right? So whoever adapts to the qualities of the heart of compassion, clarity, courage, being calm, being seen as a strength rather than being jumpy and aggressive, being seen as a strength, right, is going to be. So uh, first question was more to the panelists, do you agree with this on what you see on the ground that uh, today the corporate world is ready for the next phase? Or do you think that's some time away and it's a statement which is ahead of its time? Can I maybe just um, um, jump in um, briefly? Uh, I, I think it, I think it's uh, quite a uh, profound insight. Uh, I'm not sure, for my part, whether um, empathy, compassion, uh, those um, wonderful qualities that we see them playing out. I mean, actually, if you look at the macro level and the political stage, um, they seem far from the uh, key, key qualities. We seem to see um, kind of ag aggression, um, uh, mob rule, and um, wedge politics, if I can call it that. Sort of, Driving, driving a wedge in order to um, divide and rule. We certainly see that, I think, in the UK and our politics at the moment. But I do think there's something for sure to be said um, about how, um, if we think of the phases of evolution, um, you know, um, uh, the early stages around sort of early agriculture, then the move to industrial revolution, post-industrial revolution, information revolution, um, and what the next thing is going to be. Um, for sure, the big, big development over the last 20, 30 years has been the importance of um, intellectual capital. Um, and, and, you know, the, 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 um, the technology um, and uh, the, uh, uh, the availability of information and the democratization of information through um, the internet has, has meant that um, the opportunities to get educated have been democratized and they will be increasingly democratized. Things uh, also um, are increasingly um, digitized and post-industrialized. And that means the next development inevitably is gonna be uh, around one's um, high level intellectual skills. Uh, and within that, the basket of skills are, are, are around the kind of classic uh, reasoning skills and, and analytical skills for sure. But then what's going to be the further differentiation? Uh, it's going to be the higher level, um, uh, we're calling them influencing skills, but uh, within that um, bucket, there's a bunch of stuff. Now, I think, I think um, empathy, compassion, maybe put, putting it a little bit too far at this stage of evolution, we may get there, but for sure, being able to tune into difference, being able to tune into diversity, being able to tune into what's really going on, um, it is, it's hugely important. Um, now, um, it's open to manipulation as well. We've seen that you know, a lot of the political leaders at the moment, um, uh, they don't really have integrity, uh, but what they are very good at is tuning into their audience. Um, and so those skills, whether used for good or, or, or you know, sometimes for less than good, those skills are for sure extremely important in my view. Um, Nigel, can we bring you in on that as well, just to see that? Yeah, know, the, I mean... The, the trends you've seen over time in your kind of career around leadership development. 
Wow, how, how long have we got? Um, <laughs> so, um, <laughs> no, I'm just going to think back to my anthropological research from way back when. You know, we are social animals. Let's start from the point we are social animals. The reason that our brains developed as they did, anyone who hasn't read the book Thinking Big by Robin Dunbar and the very famous um, sort of paleoanthropologist and uh, Clive Gamble, you really should read it about how we developed, why our brain developed as it did, because we needed to be able to sort of deal with very complex social relations around us all those tens of thousands of years ago. I mean, it's fascinating. So we are social animals, actually, I would say, which takes us back to the thought of actually what are the skills that are going to differentiate you, you as you operate within your organization, within your team, and how you can lead your team are going to be those social skills. Absolutely, it's going to be the critical analysis is going to be the antennae as we always used to say have you got your leadership antennae mm -hmm. turned on to almost spot as you said the politicians are very good at actually ironically <laughs> Jonathan as you said you know they're very good at noticing when people aren't picking up on signals so I would say those skills become mission critical actually and whether that's managing your stakeholders whether it's getting a sense of almost the weak signals out in the market from all the things you're noticing in your industry sector and therefore where might that take the the, the business where might that take the legal function that I'm, that I'm leading what does that mean i need to build in my team in terms of the skill sets who do we need to recruit you know all of these things but it's all about for me it's about it's about noticing things and it's about noting things and then having the social skill as well to then do the influencing as well. I could talk for hours on this, but I won't. So um, um, I'll, I'll, I'll stop there. But Natalie, Valerie, I don't know if you've got thoughts. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm just picking up on the point that you made brings me to a point that actually Navneet's made in one of the answers to the questions is it does depend on the culture of the organisation and whether you are allowed to influence, whether it is something that um, you can uh, develop internally. Having seen the evolution of lawyers over the decades that I have, we, we are in an amazing transition. Um, looking back to the lawyers that I knew that were the heavy hitters, um, they would sit behind their desk, never move. They were rainmakers. They would bring in heaps of money and expected everybody else to be as brutal as that. And we've moved on a long way. Um, we're not there and we have to accept that not everybody is there and everybody that's involved in this uh, webinar today may be going, looking at their organisation and saying, what hope is there? There is hope. It's gradual. It may be three steps forward and two steps back. Um, some as we see in our own political system here and in the US in particular, yeah, it's pretty brutal and divisive. Um, and uh, you think, oh, it's getting worse. It isn't getting worse. There's lots of statistics that globally, people are a bit more heart orientated than they used to be. So, um, you know, there, there is a lot of potential for personal growth. It does depend on the organization. Yeah, I think, you know, there, there is, there, there is a, uh, you know, uh, the reason I'm a little, little careful here when I'm responding to this Akshay is, you know, socially and otherwise, I think there's a general feeling that, uh, you know, capitalism and data and the like has not really got us where we want to be, right? Uh, and there is a general feeling that, uh, you know, there's a uh, there are other ways of doing it. And then people go searching for a spiritual answer uh, for some of these things. And unfortunately, there are a lot of charlatans out there, right? People who ignore the evidence and, uh, and you know, tell you stuff. And, and I've seen, at least in my personal life, I've seen people who have gone down the rabbit hole, right? And it's not, it's not been pleasant. But that said, I think if you look at, uh, there's a trust report, and I keep I keep dropping it in everywhere, but there's a, there's a trust called the Edelman Trust, which brings out something called the trust barometer, right? Uh, and if you look at the report for the last few years, and this is pre-COVID, pre uh, you will find that the general trust that people feel, and this is a multi international one, right? So it's across many countries, including India and China and, and the US and the UK. Uh, the trust people feel towards traditional uh, repositories of trust, right? The politicians, the media, and the like has fallen. And it's fallen a fair bit. And instead, what has gone up is the trust people feel towards their employer, right? So if you, if you look at, you know, the way companies, large companies at least, are trying to handle things, they're, they're actually coming out today and talking about 
social issues, right? So Cisco has been very, very loud in, about the abortion issue in the US. We have been loud about the pride issues in India. Uh, we have avoided getting into the political aspects of issues in India, but in the, in the US, we are very much there, right? Uh, we have been uh, jumping in about, about Russia and the Ukraine and the like, right? Uh, and the reason you do that is because you are actually being pushed to do that by your employees. Uh, you are being pushed to do that by your investors. Uh, so it's not enough for you to just be, you know, the old adage about make money for your shareholders. We are being told loud and clear that that's not enough. You need actually to be a social, uh, you know, a personality out there. And, and this creates all kinds of issues uh, for us in the in-house community, right? So, uh, so for example, if I am selling equipment, which can be used to uh, do public surveillance, right? Do I get a say as to where, uh, do I, am I happy selling it in every country? Am I happy to sell it say in the US or the UK uh, or India? Do I need to go and look into how the legal system works in those countries before I sell my products there? Does my decision change if Trump is the president or Biden is the president? How much of my personal political views influence some of those things, right? Now, these are, these are topics that will take some time for us to work our way through. But, but, when you, but what I'm trying to say is as a lawyer, you're, you know, when you became a technology lawyer or a pharma lawyer or, or a financial services lawyer, I, I doubt you ever thought about human rights issues, <laughs> right? You never, you never thought about these kind of things where you're trying to be this social citizen of the world. And, uh, and I think those issues are gonna creep in more and more as, as technology grows, as things become more and more uh, mixed, shall I say. So I don't know if it will lead to empathy and uh, more you know, heartfelt things, but, but it is true that people prefer working for organizations which they actually personally feel a connection to. And, uh, yes. and that pushes organizations to be more like that. Sorry, Jonathan, you had, I think you were trying to well, say that. Was, you, 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 yeah, you, you can't just be a lawyer nowadays. That's completely unrealistic. I mean, one of the reasons we did the three-part series on social media in the Ukraine, which, again, I thought, well, you know, traditionally people have thought you were off your, your, your trolley um, it, uh, putting this in a, um, a newsletter about, um, uh, about leadership for in house councils precisely because these, these issues are very much front and center, you know, with diversity, with ESG, it's notable, you know, it comes up on the LinkedIn feed, it comes up on other feeds. When Cisco, as I, I saw your post the other day, Navneet, on, on uh, LGBTQ um, issues, it's very, it's very clear and it's registered. Um, it feeds through, um, as you say, to your employees, it feeds through to your shareholders, and it fe feeds through to your purchasers. People purchase, they have um, purchasing decisions, and they make them uh, on a broad range of factors of which um, the, the softer, in inverted commas, but hard factors are um, very relevant. It's simply not the case that you can operate at the highest uh, level of these organizations uh, without um, uh, taking account of these factors. You look at, for example, uh, something like Facebook Meta and, and some of the difficulties they've got into um, because they have, um, some would say, um, not adequately engaged with their um, social responsibility and how that then plays through um, to shareholders, investors, employees and beyond and the kind of the ripple effect. Um, you know, if you're doing your role properly as, as um, uh, CLO of, of an organization like that or any organization of, of size, uh, you're having a, se a, a seat at the table and you're engaging in those the type of discussions. And when you're making decisions around something like social media postings and whether to engage or not engage in something that might be considered um, too political, uh, all of those factors have to be um, weighed in the mix rather than just giving a traditional uh, legal um, answer, which won't um, uh, hit the mark. Um, the only thing I'm going to just add to um, the reading list that Nigel um, said, I think, I think uh, you know, a couple of other works. I think Sapiens is, is uh, brilliant, Yuval Noah Harari in, 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 in this space. Jonathan Haidt's book, um, The Righteous Mind, a slightly different point, but is, is very, very profound. And of course, Jared Diamond's um, Guns, Germs and Steel is also, it's a slightly older book, but absolutely fascinating. Um, actually, you don't mind, unless you've got, I mean, we've kind of really took, you've really kind of thrown open, a, you know, an interesting debate about what next in terms of, you know, skills for the in-house council and also just general you know, corporates 
Um, if you don't, I will probably ask you to, uh, you do have another question. Um, oh, great. So we're gonna bring on, come on to that as well. So for the panel, two questions. So, I mean, one is from Akshay itself, which is um, how do you facilitate, um, what's around, facilitated style of learning versus unilateral learning? The, the point I also wanted to bring on for the panel was, you know, we've talked a lot about um, different styles of learning, you know, different environments. Um, we'll talk about um, like even how do you politicize, you know, employees to take a stand and uh, departments to take a stand. But with that, that kind of point was how do you create that environment where, you know, one, people can learn to learn and two, you know, really be about, you know, a people orientated culture because um, that's not easy. Um, and, you know, it can, you know, you could be a conscious employee that really wants to make a point, take a stand, but in the wrong environment, that could be the end of your career within that department organization. So um, one, how do you create that environment for being able to be a conscious contributor, you know, and also moving on to learning to learn, um, as well as Akshay's point around, you know, different learning styles. Do you want to start, Valerie? Do you want to do that? I mean, yeah, I've, I've got some, yeah, I've got I was, some thoughts, but go for it. <laughs> yeah, no, I would. No, it's a very vexed question um, because you are trying to um, help people to change who often don't have um, <laughs> the self introspection to, or the humility to have self introspection to recognize that they need some form of change and it's one of the most difficult areas it's one of the most rewarding um, because that's often where I come in. Um, because that's if that doesn't work, then it doesn't work for everybody, uh, everybody below, but I have seen some amazing things happen and how do you how do you do that i've achieved it through pound shillings and pence or dollars, um, <laughs> rupees, uh, just talking about the benefits of um, empowering others within the firm and giving them skills, helping them develop skills, that there's a return. And if you're, if I'm there long enough to be able to prove that um, ret financial return, then it's a, then it's a no brainer. But you are, People have big egos, lawyers have big egos, and we have to acknowledge that and mm -hmm. getting them to say, well, yes, I can let go. And I, you haven't, uh, hasn't been released yet, the Practical Council um, edition for this week, but it's really good. Um, it's just about uh, a world famous conductor and actually knowing when to bring in his teams of violinists or trumpeteers or whatever, when do you let them know when to come in as a team and it's it's multi-dimensional because it's the leadership of the one holding the baton but it's the leadership of each of the instruments and that's that's what a leader should be um and yeah i think nigel is itching to say how he can achieve it <laughs> it's well, achievable the, the, <laughs> all, all i was going to say was um actually for all the reasons you've just said, Valerie, I was, I was going to just Vikash give a practical tip and something that worked quite well for all the reasons you've said, Valerie, is I noticed helping people at transition points was helpful because I noticed at transition points, especially at times when they were stepping up, they were more open to learning then because often it might be something they would, you know, really want to say it was promotion to GC or partner, whatever it was. And when I've been coaching them, you know, or I was trying to almost reach them in the development sense to make them open to learn because I thought well actually they could use some learning here often the transition point they think right I've really got that role I always wanted and they think oh my gosh I've got that role I always wanted <laughs> and, and almost thought I'm in this big scary space now where I always wanted this but now I know I need some help and it was always around transition points I felt people were a little bit more open um, to you know the defenses came down a bit in the sense of saying I've got stuff to learn because I'm in you know, a bigger, broad, a raw, a broader role, a bigger role, whatever it was. I've got more responsibilities. Now I'm in charge suddenly of a team of 15 people that was never in charge. I've got a PL I need to manage or whatever it was. So that's just a little tip, uh, Valerie, in terms of sometimes when I found lawyers are more open to learning amongst, amongst other things. Interesting yeah, I think observation. Yeah. I don't think that's always been the case from what we observe at times, especially in India. <laughs> I would just like to uh, respond to what Valerie said. And it seems that because of big egos, right? If you tell lawyers what to do, 
as coming from an expert point of view, I think there'll be a strong resistance that, wow, who are you to tell us what to do? But in the facilitative style of learning, which is coaching, right? Like Nigel would relate to that being the coach himself, uh, you know, where you're just asking powerful questions to evoke awareness from within the coachee, I think there will be more acceptability in lawyers with ego where they are coming up with their own solutions, right? And they will stick to it rather than me or Nigel or anyone for that matter coming and telling, hey guys, you need to change your course like this, 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 this. I think there'll be resistance. So I just it, uh, wanted it, to get that it, uh, perspective. Yeah, I, th so, I think the, the fundamental thing, what you try to do, right? Uh, and this is true for both leaders and the, I don't know, leadies, is it? <laughs> the people you're trying to lead. Uh, is, is a saying actually one of the headmasters of one of my kids' schools once said, uh, you know, take your work seriously, but never take yourself seriously, right? Yeah. So, so if you can give your, and in Cisco we call it giving your ego the day off, right? So I, I, think, I think the important thing is for you to, the ideas are what are critical. And yeah, you know, there is a, there is a natural dichotomy there, right? There's a natural problem there. Uh, and I call it the problem of the ego, right? Which is, why do you try to do the best you do in your life, right? Why do you try to be the best uh, lawyer, the best uh, spouse, the best parent? There's, a, there's an element of ego there, right? You, you're doing it because you have a sense of self-respect. You want to do the best you can. You go, you go over and beyond. You review the document five more times than is necessary. Why? Because you're trying to do the best you can. Now, that needs ego. But the problem is when, when you cross the line from trying to be the best at what you can to mm. I know everything, that becomes an issue, right? right. So, so knowing when to draw the line there, I think that's critical. Uh, from, a, from a people leadership perspective, I think it's the, the most important thing you can do when you're a leader is you can show that you are actually interested in the individual. Right. And you may not be able to do it if your team is, you know, 400 people, but you pick the people you want to do it with. And if you're a small team, you do it with everyone. Uh, if you show that you understand them. So let me, let me give an example from my own career uh, path. There are many ways in which a person can grow. If we all agree that becoming general counsel of Asia Pacific and Japan is not your only answer, right? You can be a leader in different areas. Uh, you know, there are simple ones. There are the country roles. So there are, you know, particularly in China, Japan, Korea, you have to be local to be effective as a lawyer. So there is a growth path there for people with that, uh, with the language skills and the and this cultural skills that are required. Then you look at the individual. There will be individuals who want to grow from a technical standpoint. Maybe they want to become the leader for your large deals team. Maybe there are people who want to become the privacy expert for the region. Maybe there are people who want to be the competition law expert for the region. There are career paths there. There are others who then, who would want to follow your footsteps, right? And maybe become a semi-GC or, or a leader across the region, across different theaters. So there are these different kind of customized routes you can kind of build for them, for each person. And... And just because somebody says, hey, I want to become general counsel of uh, Asia Pacific and Japan doesn't mean that they can do it, right? So, so what are the skills that they need? And, and you coach them on that and you try to do it. And now mm. I, I follow a simple rule, which is, you know, I will try many times, right? I, and I haven't put, a, I've intentionally not put a time limit on this. Uh, I will try many times. I will coach, I will guide, I will speak. But if the person is not willing to listen to me after a point, right, I'm not going to waste too much time on that. I'm going to then pivot to somebody who is actually willing to listen. So you do, you do need to be a little ruthless at times while you do it. But uh, I think it's better to be ruthless. It's better for me to tell you, you don't have a path ahead of you in this organization now than to keep you hanging around for the next five years and then telling you when you are, you know, uh, like me, closer to 50, that, oh, you know, sorry, but you're not going to make it to the next level, right? That is actually doing the person an injustice. Uh, whereas if I told them when they were younger, maybe they would find some other role that worked for them. Maybe they would find some other organization that worked for them. So it's a, it's kind of a customized thing. You can't, you can't necessarily say this is it, right? Uh, but, but it, it is about starting from a place of empathy, right? And trying to understand where they're coming from.
We're, we're getting to Thank a wrap you. up phase because your time has already flown. We're one hour 20 into this. So um, what I'd like to do is have a quick kind of summary point from you know each of the panel members to kind of wrap up the conversation um, you know, before I conclude. Um, before we do, and Naveed, we'll bring you back in to, to do that, but it'd be good to, while you're doing that, understand, you know, as you've grown, you know, in your role as general counsel and taking on leadership roles and got a team to manage, you know, how much of your time then gets split between strategy, the, the work and mentoring, coaching your team members? Oh, uh, good question. I, I would say... I would say 60% of my time goes in people management issues, right? Uh, and this is, you know, this is not, there are the operational things you need to do, right? Uh, the, the salary reviews, the promotion reviews and, and the like. And it seems to happen, uh, maybe it's old age, right? It seems to come more and more regularly as time goes by. Every couple of months you seem to be doing it. Uh, but I think the, the other, the other the most of the other 60% is probably more listening to them. Right, so I have this rule that if I set up a one-on-one -on -one with you when you are a part of my team, I will not change it if I can help it. Right, you will always get time from me. Uh, and sometimes it's there are you know people handle it differently. Some would like to just come onto it and rant. Some like to come onto it with issues. Some are organized about it. Some are not. Right, uh, but but that's what is I would say is about sixty percent of of the time. Uh, the twenty or so percent, and I would really like that number to be higher is looking at the, the strategy side of the house. And when I say strategy, it's not just the big bang, I will do X, Y, and Z as a company. It's also, I, I try to bring in legal tech into that, right? So if I, if I want to look at how do I, you know, there are two parts to my job the way I see it. One is how do I make the day-to-day -day life of my people easier? And the second is how do I try and improve what my company does, right? And how do I contribute to that? Uh, so, so I would say that 20% of the time goes in that, uh, probably more towards helping my team as opposed to uh, the big strategy things, because that doesn't, it doesn't happen that regularly, as you know. Uh, and so that comes as, brings it to 80. I would say 20 of that and the balance 20 is probably more specific business side issues, uh, you know, as part of the management team and trying to look at issues. And I, I, tend to find that I spend a lot of time in meetings, <laughs> which is fine. I, I like meeting, I like people. Uh, not necessarily a fan of meetings per se, but, uh, but I, you know, once in a while, if I get an opportunity, in fact, one of my lawyers gave me the feedback the other day that the, the moment I come to you with an issue, you want to see the document, right? And, uh, and they were like, okay, you know, I think I don't want to show you the document, right? <laughs> because you will find something. Yeah. Uh, it's, uh, you, know, you start getting the drafting and stuff. And, and so, so be, being aware when to step back and, uh, you know, that has been something for me that I've worked on. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm still very old style. So when I see something with a spelling error, I will, I will jump on it. Uh, and, and then <laughs> I'm lawyer's I curse. It's a lawyer's curse. So. Yeah. And, and, and that's where your eye goes first. Right. And, and I look at it and then I say, no, you know, does it really change anything? Is that, you know, if there is a, if there is a knot where it should not have been, that's a problem because that kind of turns the whole thing upside down. But, but sometimes maybe it doesn't really matter if there is an extra E in there. Right? Yeah. Uh, but, so that's been the piece. But that would be that would be roughly how my day looks because. All right, super. Right, um, Valerie, you're kind of uh, one minute on a kind of the, the topic and you know what we've been kind of discussing today. My final words of wisdom are um, continuous development. I know it sounds trite to say it, but you, you will never stop learning. And the sooner a lawyer realizes that. <laughs> uh, yeah. uh, my second point is actually become more organized. If you're more organized, you can do what Navneet is saying. You, you have to make time for what is the priority at whatever stage you are at your um, career. And the third point is guide rather than rule, wherever you are, in the pecking order, um, your responsibility is to guide others, not to rule, and to give them your time so that you help them become uh, better at what they do, as well as introspection for what you should be doing to yourself or yourself. I mean, you know, very simple but practical points, but stuff that is really, I mean, you've, seen, you've been in this market, our market so long that you see 
all common sense points that are not very common, you know, um, but, you know, stuff that does really add value to the, the way the business functions. It does. Jonathan? Yeah, first of all, just fantastic discussion. I'm really grateful to um, fellow panel members and again to IDEX for organising this. Um, just going to go to, back to Matt Neat's point about ego. Um, I, I'd frame it slightly differently. I think you've got kind of good ego and bad, bad ego. Um, you know, what you're wanting to build is, is uh, a, a strong, uh, good ego. Uh, you need ego and you need positive ego to perform well and a top leadership level. You need great strength of ego, great self-belief um, and to be centred. Um, and, you know, there's various aspects to that that are, that are complex to unpack. And, and self-reflection uh, is trying to uh, minimise bad ego. That's, that's the ego that is um, defensive, that is command and control, that's not giving people space, that's barking at people, getting um, short and, and um, terse with them. That's a very difficult thing to do. And that's why it truly is, I think, a lifelong journey and one of continuous um, development. Yeah. yeah. Um, Nigel, your, um, your minute before you wrap up. Sure, thank you. Um, so I'm to paraphrase, paraphrase a famous phrase, um, be the developmental change you want to see in your legal team, I'm going to say. And I mean by that, we've talked about environment to learn. Do you talk yourself about how you've learned something, whether it's from a, somewhere in your network, something you went on a course about, or even when you tried something that didn't go 100% well. So be that person that people see talking about the things you would like them to do. Whether it's, you know, oh, and I learned something by actually letting someone else in the team have a go at something. I learned something by actually speaking to someone that I've never spoken to before in the organization. Da, 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 da. So be that person of role model the things you want to see other people doing because they will learn much more from your actions, you know, or even in a team meeting, if you say, do you know what, in this team meeting, I'd love to hear the, the most junior person speak first today. And, you know, just try different things, try different things, get knowledge, as we said, going in different directions, but role model that yourself. And then you will give you, it's the best way of giving people permission and the message that that's what you want them to do. That's leadership. That's leadership for me, Vikas. Yeah, and that's a really great point. I know when we've done kind of team off sites and team meetings and we've had brainstorming sessions, I'm always shocked by it. it's the ones, sometimes the most junior, the newest in the organisation, the ones that um, don't normally say much in the office, sometimes come out with the bright ideas, and the bright, bright questions, because and the kind of, why are you doing this? And we're like, because we've never questioned it. And, you know, it, it's true that you have no idea where, you know, inspiration and kind of genius is going to come from. So give everyone that opportunity. So I'd like to thank everyone, you know, the panel, because it's been, I didn't think we'd be able to do 90 minutes. Me and Jonathan were debating about this. Um, and uh, he's probably, well, I'm going to finish before 90 minutes, so I'm, so I'm correct. Um, but on a, you know, we've really touched on, you know, stuff that we could spend days talking about on leadership development and how to create a learning environment, um, which is not an easy challenge for, for lawyers. Um, we'll be building on these conversations um, with follow-up webinars and also the launch of Practical Council India on 4th of July, which as we mentioned earlier, is a specialist newsletter bringing global viewpoints and experience to the Indian lawyer community around leadership, management, and relational issues for the in-house council. Uh, do look out for that first edition. Please give us feedback and contribute because the whole point of the newsletter isn't simply a one-way dialogue or one-way kind of interaction. It's really about the feedback from the Indian community to see then how we can further fine tune and develop the content that's more relevant for, for in-house council and in-house departments. Uh, thank you for thank you everyone for tuning in. Um, good afternoon in the UK and Europe and uh, good evening to those in India. It's Friday night, so I'm sure you've got things to, to crack on with. Uh, so thank you very much. <laughs>